Hey everybody and welcome to the Atheist Experience, otherwise known as your official Super Bowl pregame show. Uh, I am Russell Glasser and with me today, hopefully not having a, mal a wardrobe malfunction, is Martin Wagner. <laughs> no, I didn't wear my clips today. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you told me, I would have. Uh, today is Sunday, February 6th, uh, 2011. Uh, we are a live call-in public access tel uh, atheist TV show based in Austin, Texas. We are available to an international audience through our live stream at ustream.tv, and apparently those are the only people who are going to be watching today. Mm. Check the website for more details about the show and our parent organization, the Atheist Community of Austin, at www.atheist-community.org. You can provide feedback for the show by visiting the unofficial show blog, uh, atheistexperience, one word, .blogspot.com, or email us at tv at atheist-community.org. And if you enjoy the show today, uh, please come and join us for dinner after the show, beginning around 6 o'clock at El Arroyo. Uh, that's at 1624 West 5th Street in downtown Austin. Uh, now, for, for the aforementioned international viewers who might not be in the know about curious American customs, mm -hmm. we got this thing which we call football, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which is... Um, you know that I'm patronizing you guys, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, no, so what is, there's what, what the there's the yearly uh, the yearly advertising extravaganza, which people uh -huh. say they tune in for. Yes, um, yeah, when it's, it's all about when the commercials. People spend tons of money in, in order to uh, produce their best and most watched commercials of the year, mm -hmm. and there's some football going on in between. And so, anyway, in past years, before the uh, Atheist Experience was an international spa smash hit. We um, need an echo effect every time you say that. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. International. Um, in past years, that would have meant that we had n very few people watching, and we would have had to pad out a lot more time with uh, with ad-libbing ourselves. <laughs> We're about to say something else, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with well-researched material. Uh, it's carefully rehearsed ad-libbing, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, now it just means that uh, we will get even fewer local callers than usual and more people calling in and saying, hey, I love you guys and I listen to you all the time, which is so interesting well, for we the don't, podcast we, may, they, we have no idea what they'll say. Yes, they may, like, that's you true. Know, want to talk about... Their dog Skippy or something. I yeah, think. Uh, and until we have any callers actually up on the board, well, mm. okay, we do. We've got one. I'm but go, we can do a quick thing here. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and fill out some time to give more time for the uh, lines to fill up by reading unrehearsed an email that we got uh, just today. Mm. Dear Atheist Experience, I am a devout Christian who has been watching some clips of episodes from your show, and while I don't agree with your Christian bashing, your God-mocking, your complete disrespect for the body of Christ, and your disregard for the spiritual realm, <laughs> guilty as charged. Yeah, yeah. okay. We'll, we'll load up to that one. <laughs> sure. I do have to say that you did have a right to get away from the institutional, denominational, so-called churches that some of you were a part of. Oh. Well, well, thank you. Yeah. We also have a right to do the Christian bashing, God mocking, uh, and uh, complete you know, disrespect for the, the body of Christ. Spiritual um, realm uh, mocking. Yes. But I, I think she's saying she's cool with it. Um, uh, the the well, she's cool, the not cool with the part. first batch, but the last part. Yeah. yeah. I was a part of the Roman Romanian Orthodox Church, but I broke away from it because of their false teachings. Oh, and I did to some other false teachings. Sorry, mm -hmm. to, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Um, mm -hmm. I was indoctrinated by my grandmother, and I have to say that uh, did offer some benefits, but it also 
brought me into an institutionalized denominational church. I was forced to go to church by my grandmother, and I ended up dreading Sunday mornings because when I was young, church seemed boring and a waste of time to me. Oh, perish the thought. Who would have... <laughs> Uh, you don't say. I've actually been to church like twice in the last five years mm -hmm. and taken copious notes, which is probably not why most people go. <laughs> then, uh, then as I got older, church seemed less terrible to me and I could actually tolerate staying at the worship service instead of joining the other children in the playroom. Then after a few years later, after I got caught watching pornography on the internet. Oh, mm. in I church? Began I, I'm, by the way, I'm not naming this person's name, so you know sure, I'm not yeah. trying to embarrass somebody on the uh, on the internet. <laughs> um, we're just using your letter to fill time. <laughs> I began seeking repentance for many sins. I began seeking God in many different ways, uh, trying to tell him how sorry I was. I then started watching the Catholic channel, EWTN, whenever I could because I thought that they had what I was looking for. I was learning from the nuns and cartoons on EWTN. I this is really a long letter. I mean, we have to write yeah, yeah. the whole thing, or can we like skip bits? No, okay. Yeah. Uh, just sort of... Um, well, sorry about this. You, you yeah. want to go off on a tangent on uh, on the no, sin just, of pornography? No, I was just <laughs> not <sorry>. really. <laughs> I mean, sure, we could do a whole hour on that. Yeah, okay. um, but I was uh, just gonna say that it sounds like she's making the whole. No, it's not yes. about it. It's a faith, not a religion thing. Right. Or I think the, she should uh, not be ashamed of of uh, mm -hmm. you know normal human sexuality. Yeah. But um, anyway. Let's Unless see, she was skipping like ahead. Like really, you know, goat sea type stuff. In which case, <laughs> that was like, yeah, yeah, be embarrassed about that. Yeah, um, that's, now, that's... some atheists ask me if I become a Christian, what denomination should I choose? Wait, which wait. I think is a rhetorical question. I, I skipped ahead. Yeah, no, that's fine. But it's I, I think why this would... is a rhetorical question when atheists to ask it because yeah. what what they're asking is what even if I come to the conclusion that there is a God, mm -hmm. why should I conclude that your particular flavor of it is right? Exactly. Because you would think that, uh, you know, if there was this one truth, we have this religion with something like 38... I hear this, I hear the figure 38,000 individual Christian sects. Yes. I've not actually seen a reference to fully and, confirm that. And many but, of them mutually believe that the others are going to hell. Right. You know, but yeah, it is true that there are all these little branch, you know, splitters, and you, know, you get the people's front of Judea, Judean people's front, that sort of thing going on. Right. And so, um, right, who, who, who's got, uh, who has the right version if this is all one truth? And a point that we've made before is that science generally tries to converge on one answer. Like, you mm -hmm. know, there are, there are disputes among scientists about, um, you know, whether it's this way or that way. But generally, uh, it tends to be that over time, there's a way to check whether one or the other is correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and everybody sort of narrows down to, like, maybe a handful of possible interpretations before eliminating the alternatives entirely, mm -hmm. for the most part. Religion doesn't do that. I mean, you no, know, no. there's not 38,000 the different interpretations of gravity <laughs> because you can check on those. Yeah. Well, that's what, I mean, yeah, science is about eliminating things until you get to the right answer. Uh -huh. Whereas religion is just, since you're making it all up anyway, it's all about well, what, are you, is what are you seeking? starting with what you consider the right answer. Yeah. What, what kind of, you know, it's all about sort of fulfilling these weird emotional psychological needs in people. Right, and, and then and then it's so at that point you just embrace whatever uh, appeals to that yeah. personal need, and so, it's not about objective facts and and what the evidence does or does not show to support them. So this last bit, she says, well, the answer is none denomination that is mm -hmm. just seek God and he'll show himself maybe not right away but when he wants to because he's in charge and mm -hmm. I, I would have to say not choosing a particular sect doesn't fix the problem in fact it makes it worse because that's how more new sects get started yeah once She's they now decide that every single uh, concept of God that everybody has is right and the voices in her head are the ones that are the that that tell the actual truth mm -hmm. We've got 38,001. Yeah, this person has just become a sect with one member. Yeah, that's congratulations. All. A new one, yeah, that's it. Uh, now, I know because your lack of belief, you're not believing any in any of this. Got but it God, in one. Yeah. But God can show himself to you even in your doubt. 
He may not come to you when or even how you're expecting, but you will see him either in life or after life. Well, that is, narrows it down, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> it's like, let's cover all the bases so that you don't actually have to provide any kind of evidence right. for that claim. Keep doing what you're doing. Bash this institutional be building called church. Bash its followers for their delusional beliefs. Bash the Pope. I don't care. But I tell you, there is a God, and he sent his son named Jesus to die on a cross for sin so that humans and God may be together again. Which is ridiculous on its face, right. but we'll keep going. Now, she started out, I, I mean, people tell us we're offensive for all yeah. the bashing we do. But this person, I, I mean, you know, it's highlighting a fact that mm -hmm. religions all bash each other. Yeah. <laughs> I can't we, think. They're, they're just upset that it's them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but then in the end, what does she offer again? It's the same apology, it's the same Jesus myth that yeah. all of these religions and denominations and institutionalized churches that she's dismissing are, are, are offering. You know, God has a son, he sent his son to die for your sins. It's the same story. Right. And the question, I so mean, you know, really... The, you just think it's better because you've, you know, really divorced the, the word church the from it The only all. main question in all of atheism and skepticism is, how do you know? Yeah. Yeah, That's is it. any of this stuff actually true? Can you demonstrate that it's true? How can you demonstrate that this God you're telling me about exists in reality and not just in your imagination? Yeah, and when people what ask, you what is your best argument for atheism or against God, that's really what you have to come back to over and over again is, how do you know? Yeah. Well. Anyway, that okay. was fun, and we've got Mark in Austin, Mark in Texas. Austin, who is local. Let's start with local fellow. Good. There you are. Mark. Hi. I, I have a lot of experience with theology and the academic side of Christianity, so okay. I thought I would call in and have a polite debate with you. That's fantastic. Uh, where uh, you, uh, I'm seeing on the board here, are uh, calling on behalf of your church? A lot of the youth at my church have been watching your program. <laughs> um, thank Hi. you. And while myself and the parents find it Amusing. We are worried that the youth are being tricked and deceived by our program. Oh, oh dear. Well, um, we don't. I think you're do on that. to us. Uh oh. Yeah. No, but seriously. Also, my I mean... congregation is watching, so please be polite. Last time, okay. someone from our congregation called. Your host Jeff was uh, wild. Je Jeff can be a bit of a firebrand. I'll admit that. Uh, you're going to need to. We're feeding it. back. We've got some feedback. Yeah, you're, you're, if you're watching okay. on your television while you're We've talking, we've been having us, some problems with the uh, with studio stuff for the last few weeks. Okay. So, um, because also, be if you're watching if you're watching the program and you have your television turned up, sometimes that will feed back into the phone also. Okay. So you don't want to do that. Well, um, anyway, you know, well, the the rule of this program is that you get what you give. So you know, um, we're all about having polite discussions. Yeah, so, you know, it, but it works both ways. So. And so, uh, have you mentioned what what your church is? Mark, Pardon, so I can't hear you very well. Oh, okay. Uh, have you mentioned what your church is? Would you like to plug them? My church is the Austin Stone. Um, okay. And, um, Hi, Austin Stone. Go on. We are a New Testament church. Okay. Okay, so well, what's your question? Or what would you like to talk about well, today? Well, my question um, is, first of all, um, is it true that on your show, um, you made um, a comparison between God and Bigfoot. Oh, very likely, yes. Yeah, we quite possibly have done that, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> okay uh, first of all, um, it is true there is no Bigfoot um, because there simply are no transitional forms. Uh, there, there is a, a $10,000 like cash prize <laughs> for anyone who presents a transitional form to, um, yeah, but to, I, to I Ray, think, Ray Comfort. I, I think you're, <laughs> Ray Comfort. Oh, oh you're, you're one of this batch. All right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I think you'll find that the reason that we brought up Bigfoot is because people frequently ask us, why don't you believe in God? And, uh, and can you prove that there's no God? And... The kind of response that we usually uh, that we usually throw out there is it doesn't have to be Bigfoot. It could be leprechauns or fairies or unicorns. But the question is, mm -hmm. do you believe you don't believe in Bigfoot? But can you prove that there's no Bigfoot? 
Well, I, I think you are correct that Bigfoot is not real. However, God is real. Right, but you can't prove that Bigfoot doesn't exist. That is probably the point that somebody was trying to make by bringing it up earlier. Yes. Um, so, okay. what we're saying, I, I'm sorry, uh, I should draw these lines a little better. When we say, when we say that uh, we're atheists and we don't believe that God exists, the point that we're making is that in order to demonstrate that something like a God exists, um, the burden of proof rests on the person making the claim. So if you wanted to make me believe that Bigfoot exists, you would have to find, you would have to first present some pretty convincing reasons why you would believe in Bigfoot. Now you don't believe in Bigfoot. Um, you do believe in this uh, omnipotent presence in the universe. And all we like to say is basically, you know, how do you know? What kind of evidence would you have about that? Now, this is where you start to lose your credibility with people okay. who have watched uh, the program before. Well, I'm uh, sorry because, about that. Because Matt Slick already did a proof for God. Yeah, and we you just... You might remember it from the episode he called in and embarrassed Matt Dillahunty, your organization's <laughs> That's, oh, that's really funny. not how we saw it. Actually, yeah. what, what's interesting is that after that episode happened, he went back and changed the, uh, the web page where he was making that argument because uh, Matt demonstrated that uh, his argument didn't work. Right, right. Well, because the point is, is that you can take, you could take Matt's, mm -hmm. I wasn't on that actual program, but we watched it. Uh, you I could mean, take Matt, Matt Slick, Yeah, you, know, you could take yeah. Matt Slick's entire, uh, we've, we're familiar with the transitional argument for God, and, we, and there was that whole uh, program about it. The problem with it, as Matt Slick presents it on the CARM website, is that you can take his entire argument word for word, right? Every single one of his points, as it's outlined, and... Even if you were to grant him, for the sake of argument, every one of his premises, although um, on that program we pointed out where some of the, uh, Matt pointed out, Matt Dillahunty pointed out where some of the premises were flawed, even if you took his entire argument as written and said, all right, I'll grant you this, I'll grant you this, I'll grant you this, I'll grant you this, you get right down to his conclusion at the very bottom where he says, uh, and we call this creative force or whatever, we call this thing God, right? When you get to his conclusion, you can take his entire argument, you can replace the word God in the conclusion with Zeus, with the flying spaghetti monster, with any mythical being that you care to dream up. And the argument works just as well. All right? you, can, you, can, you can take his entire argument as worded and come up with the same conclusion, and we call this being the invisible magic space pixie. And the, and the argument works just as well. So that essentially is why the argument failed. And what well, Matt, Sli I, I, and what Matt think, Slick did was... I, I think that Matt Slick's point was that um, everything is physical or conceptual. So, so, it, so, so absolute but do you agree with me that you can, are not physical. But do you so agree with me that you can do that with his argument? And that means they're concept in God's mind. Well, how, so, do you, how do you distinguish uh, God's... Well, first off, how do you distinguish God's mind as a thing that actually exists? Well, that is how you... How you prove that um, God's mind exists? But I just, but as then I just the, explained the to you, the evidence from the Bible will uh, prove that the Christian God exists. But the, the, what I what I just what I just brought up, right, was that the transcendental argument for God, as Matt Slick had written on the Karm website, in its exact wording, you can re replace the word God with the name of any mythological being that you choose, and the argument works just the same. And you didn't disagree with me when I said that. So do, shall I take that as agreement that the argument works just well as the transcendental argument for anything? It proves that there's a mind. Well, well, how does it, okay, well, how does it even on. prove... Can I, can I change well, ta track? I'm sorry. Right. No, I'm just, well, I, I just want to say, but you agree then that the argument can be used just as well to prove, prove... Any, any mythological being as well as God. Am I right or am I wrong when I suggest that? It proves there is some God, then the Bible proves the God is the Christian God. Well, how do you get from the wording of that argument to the Bible? I mean, where's the link from that argument to the Bible? Because again, you could say, 
again, you could take the argument, as I've just suggested, replace God with Zeus, right? And then you could say, the argument proves that there is a God, and then Greek mythology proves that that God is Zeus. See, what you're saying to me is exactly Greek the same as saying that. Greek mythology did not have eyewitnesses. Well, I mean, as far no. as we know, anyone who wrote as the Bible, I mean, you yeah. know, that came like 30 years later. But I'd also like to go back to one of the premises you were talking about earlier. You said that everything is, uh, I'm sorry, remind me of the wording, everything is either physical or conceptual, right? Right? Can you hear me? Mark, can you hear Russell? Mark. Are you there? Hello? I'm not... I'm not hearing Mark yeah, anymore. Yeah, control room, did we, did we lose Mark? Okay. Oh. All right. Hang on. We're sorry about this. The, uh, okay, technical problems. Um, also, earlier on, uh, in, to, okay. in, in terms of comparing God to Bigfoot while we're waiting to get whatever issue is, 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 is a problem right now. Um, we're going to put you on hold, Mark, and we're going to try again in two minutes. I'm sorry about this. Okay. Um, well, Bigfoot, well, God, Loch Ness Monster. It, I want to finish what I was saying, actually. Oh, okay. I'm about, sorry. Go ahead. So, I, I mean, the premise of this transcendental argument is that uh, everything is either physical or conceptual. And the idea is that uh, if... Uh, if these things are to exist, then the conceptual stuff must be held in the mind of something called a god, uh, uh, unless there are human minds to conceive of it. So my question, and, and I think the approach that Matt took when Matt Slick called, was which one is God? Is God physical or is God conceptual? Because uh, if God is one of those or the other, then obviously the basic issue of the question has not gone away. It's just been transferred, like who's conceiving of God or where did the physicalness of God come from? Mm -hmm. And if you say that God is neither physical nor conceptual, then you have to then, identify. Then you've, you've undercut your own argument because by saying everything is mm -hmm. physical or conceptual, then you're making a special exception to the rule that you say applies to everything. And right. once you acknowledge that there's stuff that is neither physical nor conceptual, then uh, the argument doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mark, we have no idea what happened to the audio on, yeah. on uh, getting you in here. So... Uh, um, We'd like to invite you. Maybe sorry. try try hanging up and calling back. And no, the, don't try don't that. Do, well, because that may work. And we'll, a, yeah, we'll, but let's check a, if another caller works first. Uh, well, that, yeah, because that could be the case. Because be again, the whole phone system. You know, as sorry, you know, we folks, really we've had for several been weeks having yeah. technical problems well, for a while. We'll see if we've got him back now. For a while. Uh, okay, give another shot to Mark. Are you there? None of that. Hello. What? Hello. I heard something. Hello. 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 Yeah. Hi. Hello, you're on. Who's this? This isn't Mark, is it? No. We'll find out. Who's this? Hi. Hello? Hello? Yeah, you. Face Palm Day at Atheist Experience Television. All right. Maybe they can't hear me again. I don't know. Okay, uh, caller, go ahead. Identify yourself if you can hear me. Uh, I can kind of hear you, not real well. Okay. All right. Well, go ahead with your question. And, uh, you know, even though you can't hear us, we'll try to answer you and uh, go ahead, ask your question, and then maybe we'll put you back on hold and answer you. All right. Um, I, I'm in an uh, ethics class, and uh, our professor was giving us the question of, uh, that, well, he was making the statement that uh, science is always catching up to religion. Uh, <laughs> I would put it the other way. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would, I would have to too. But I was wondering, what, what would you say about that? Because there, what he was arguing was that, uh, like, be it like a uh, women's intuition stuff, uh, or the fact that that science has always kept, has been catching up to that too recently. I guess. Hmm. hmm. Well, I, I think I know the argument that's been made here. I mean, okay. but. I mean, the thing is, for instance, people will say that, uh, not to use the Christian example, the Koran oh, perfectly okay. predicts the speed of light. 
Yeah, you know, that, yeah. and then they'll come up with some elaborate interpretation of some really quite vague verse where they can shoehorn it in and and say, okay, if we pick this number and this number and this number and we multiply them out according to what the Quran says, then we find that the Quran has a remarkably accurate prediction of the speed of light. And it's all cherry picking concepts, right? I mean, it's all going back and. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's all going back with stuff that science has already found out and then retrofitting it to do, uh, to make ancient books look like they have more knowledge than they actually do. I mean, you could do the same thing with Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky, right? <laughs> you know, it turns out that slithy toves actually means neutrinos. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, Our uh, for, yeah. for instance, people will claim that uh, the Bible predicted that the earth was spherical, um, which, which doesn't really tell the whole story because according to the Bible, there is a mountain from which you can see every part of the earth, which is not really possible on a sphere, you know? Right. Um, and so, and like Jeff D has always said, the Bible is the big book of multiple choice. Uh -huh. uh, and so if you pick some parts of it and ignore other parts of it, and you're very generous with your interpretation, then you can say that the Bible had this, uh, this incredibly foresightful scientific knowledge and ignore the fact that Genesis says, for instance, that there was light before there was sun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or or depending, depending which chapter of Genesis you read, I mean, you have the two uh, contradicting creation stories right there at the beginning of the book. Right. All right. Where Genesis 1 has one version of how creation went, and then you switch to Genesis 2. Yeah. Go on, and uh, go on and to you Gen can hand two, wave and then those you get a whole other, Yeah, uh, creation stories. So... Um, uh, I mean, you can you can absolutely hand wave those away in the mm -hmm. same way that you can hand wave Jabberwocky to sound like whatever you want. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you could have figured this stuff out going solely from the Bible mm -hmm. and uh, and not actually applying things that we already knew before claiming that uh, that they're things that we can find out from the Bible. Sure. I mean, the way to confirm you know, claims like this, and and this would seem to be. You know, either this particular uh, professor is a theist himself, or if not, he's taking some sort of accommodationist position, you know, which uh, we tend to find really annoying. Um, and said, I don't know, I have no idea. But usually the way that you can respond to these kinds of claims with, look, if, if, if science is catching up to stuff religion already knew, then point to any uh, evidence that, for example, anyone in the 15th century uh, you know, knew what neutrinos were. Or you know, or dark energy, or understood how to you know perform delicate microsurgery solely by reading scripture for their knowledge as to how to do these things. You know, yeah. If this, you know, it's, so it's it's always it, it's curious how it's always after the scientific discovery has been made by science that the religious community turns around and, and says, oh, well, but, but that was always there. Right. You know, we always knew how. You know, the, I, God I had always revealed you. that. <laughs> So that someday, like a hundred years from now, mm -hmm. people are going to be saying, look how accurately the Bible describes evolution. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. I betcha. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, anyway, so if you don't, uh, if, uh, so I guess that's it pretty much. I mean, okay. I don't have anything Do more to Do you have say. anything else? Yeah. I keep looking up at where the speaker is, yeah, <laughs> which I, know. I keep telling myself not to do. Oh. But, uh, I guess I don't not. Know. Okay, I guess we're done I, with that. I we'll see feel we... like the sound is still not where it should be. And Mark, if you're out there, I'm really sorry. Uh, yeah, we didn't maybe, cut you off. We we yeah. want to talk to you. Maybe other members of Mark's church could keep trying to call mm -hmm. just so that somebody manages to get in. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can also you can also go uh, you know email us at tvdatheist-community.org. You can uh, visit uh, the show blog, which you know after the program we're gonna always you know once again put up our our. Uh, daily post about this program, which will be, you know, the open comment thread to, uh, you know, pertaining to this episode, and anybody who wants to uh, comment there, either Mark or anyone from his church, um, can do so. So, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I guess we'll go next to Joseph in Seattle. Joseph? How you doing, sir? Hey, am, I, am I on? Hi, yes. I, yes, you are, actually. We can hear you. Hey guys, how you doing, man? I'm really glad to be on. I, I love your I love your guys' show. I uh, 
used to be a Christian rapper uh, in Seattle and full on Christian, and I, I start start wanting to go to seminary school, start looking into look, uh, studying the Word of God, and I actually um, got a hold of Bart Yerum's book on accident, and it, it showed me the contradictions, which led me into questioning like I always have my whole life, and. Uh, Kind of led me into to doing my own study for the last year, kind of like you guys do, and like you did when you became an atheist and start studying more, more on the Word of God, probably more than the Christians actually do. You, you know what it is? Is the devil influence of rap led you astray? That must be it. Yeah. <laughs> you thought sorry, it was safe I, to dabble I'm in. Sorry, it. I'm sorry. What did you say? <laughs> I, I said the devil influence of rap actually led you astray, even though you thought it was safe because it was Christian rap. Exactly. The devil throws darts at you. That's what my friends are all telling me. I go, yeah, right. He probably threw the church in, too, at the dart. I knew it. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted, I wanted to say something to you guys. Mm. Um, I, I've been listening to everybody talk about evolution, and um, I was wondering, what did, I was watching a show that all, all um, dogs actually derive from the gray wolf. And as the show was going on, they actually showed that a gray wolf couldn't be domesticated from a baby wolf on up because by the second or third month, the wolf would actually start jumping on the table and actually start acting wild again, and it couldn't actually tame the thing. But some people in Russia actually took a bunch of wolves and se segregated them and actually raised them up from babies over years. And within five or ten years or 15 years, I think it's been 50 years on the mix now, these dogs, uh, the wolves actually start changing shape. Their noses start changing. They actually start looking mm -hmm. like dogs. And after a long period of time, they start actually, I actually saw it on TV where the dogs were, the wolves are actually starting to change. Based how many generations does this take? A long period of time of domestication. Yeah. And so I was thinking to myself, I always hear these guys say humans, these monkeys don't turn into humans. <laughs> However, it's the same thing as the gray wolf. You don't see gray wolves turning into dogs in the woods. It yeah. takes a long period of time for the gray wolf to actually be domesticated. I just wanted to get that out there. And I also wanted to say, too, if the church is listening right now, not often, um, you guys talk about transitional uh, forms that I always read in the Bible, Ezekiel 1, 4, and a bunch of other locations where they're always talking about transitional forms where the guy had the head of a human and the arms of a, of a wings of an eagle and the, <laughs> the legs of a calf and, and all these transitional forms in the Bible. It seems that the Bible talks more about things that are mixed with animals than than the evolutionists do. It was a creepy time, wasn't it? Isn't that true? Well, you know, we're feeding back again. Uh, can know. you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, just a little bit, of, a little bit of feedback over your last uh, thing. Yeah, well, I, you know, the Bible was written during a uh, pre-scientific and, and very strange time. It would have been a time uh, in human history that would be completely alien to us and our way of thinking. So uh, it's um, certainly not surprising that there are a lot of things in that book that are just patently bizarre when right. you read and them. Of, cor of course, a creationist would say about the wolf example that, aha, mm -hmm. uh -huh, the wolf is still a wolf. You cannot cross kinds, mm -hmm. which is interesting because there is no scientifically recognized term kinds. Yeah, it's uh, not I actual mean, taxonomical. You know, we we <laughs> know like there's Linnaean classification like species and genus and, and uh -huh. family, but um, even those are, uh, are considered by scientists to be extremely mm -hmm. blurry because, I mean, the definition of species is basically something that can't or won't interbreed with any other species, but even yeah. that gets blurry because... Um, like, actually, there are grasshoppers which are considered different species because they play different kinds of songs that don't attract each other. Uh, and so they would be physically capable of interbreeding, but they don't. Yeah. Well, Another um, thing about the whole um, this, uh, confusion. Go ahead. I love mean, the subject. I, really, I mean, I, did, I haven't been able to get a hold of you guys for two months, so I'm kind of excited. I, uh, <laughs> I wanted to give you guys some information. Okay. You guys got a pen and paper on you? Um, okay, yeah. I have a computer. Well, you're like this down, I hear a lot of atheists calling in, and they always want to argue against these Christians because I debate against them all the time. I'm pretty, I pretty much pull the big guns out on them when I come to a debate too. But write this down. Write down skeptic annotated Bible. Oh yeah, we go there all the time. Yeah, <laughs> skeptic annotated Bible dot com. Get that all the time. Yeah. Okay, and also, and I also wanted to say to, uh, I also wanted to say one thing. You know, when they when they say God. Uh, if we had a creator, you know, you guys always mention God having a creator. If you really look at what words are, uh, words are utterances, noises, and symbols that describe thoughts, feelings, and experiences that men created or some kind of object. So if you take the word God and you write it on a piece of paper, you can't write the word first and then put the action and the experience and the thought to the word. You actually have to have the thought, the feeling, and the experience first 
<laughs> before you have a symbol to describe these things, or an object like a king or, or an idol, before they actually decided to start praying to some god that didn't exist or an invisible god in the sky. So I always say, if you want me to show you where God really came from, I'll write it down on a piece of paper. This symbol came from our thoughts, feelings, and experiences. So let me show you how to get rid of them. You turn the eraser around and erase God off the board and say, now where's your God? And I look at my these guys that I'm debating against, and I say, now you're only stuck with the human that first created the thought, feeling, and experience that created the symbol on the paper anyway. Yeah, and I, the I mean... You want, if you want to turn that God into a Christian God or a Chinese God or whatever God you want to turn it into, that's up to you. But it, it all derived from our thoughts, our feelings, and experiences. And if you do good thoughts, feelings, and experiences, you're going to create good symbols to describe them. If you do bad things or you want to blame some, some mean old... Uh, crappy guy like the devil okay. for yeah. all the stuff that you do. You can hey. use that symbol to blame all your bullshit on. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Joseph, uh, we've only got an hour-long show, and I think we're going to have to move on to some other calls. I mean, we now. appreciate you wanting to get all that <laughs> out, and thanks everything, but we're, we are limited for time. But, yeah, um... But thanks a bunch. Yeah, and, thanks and for calling. We still need to see if these phones work, but uh, you know, feel free well, again. I mean, obviously, they work. Well, but they may not work for every line. We still don't know yet. So, yeah. Um, well, anyway, anyway uh, see you. Yeah. So, but thanks. Thanks for calling. I can't. I can't hear you guys that well. Anyway, hey guys, just thanks for letting me on. I mean, I hope I can call it some other time. Right. Maybe I'll talk. So. All right. See you later. <laughs> and I do think it's important not to confuse the concept of a thing with the thing itself. Yeah, because, the map is I mean, not the place. You know, yeah. if I, if I say like my cat. Uh -huh. um, you know, the written word "my cat" is is based on a concept that I have of my cat. Mm -hmm. um, but the cat itself actually maps out to something that exists in the real world, and this is kind of a kind of a confusion that I think a lot of people have with God, especially with when they say things like. Um, you know, oh, the very fact that you're talking about God means that you understand what it is and therefore it must exist. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, we have real and imaginary con concepts. And what we're really trying to get at here as atheists is, does the concept of God map onto something that can be shown to be real? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, all the verbal hand waving about transcendental and physical stuff uh -huh. uh, will not create that God out of whole cloth. Some evidence would be nice. Yeah, and it's, it, it all comes down to the, the very same question that I ask every Christian I talk to, which is, how can you demonstrate that the God you believe in is real and not simply something that exists in your imagination? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, the, and the key word there is demonstrate. Right. Um, and, of course, when it comes to Ray Comfort, since our previous caller mentioned <laughs> Ray Comfort has a $10,000 yeah. challenge, uh -huh. that's a challenge to convince Ray Comfort mm -hmm. <laughs> that evolution is real. And, you know, uh, all, all... I would not attempt that. And, I would fail at that, definitely. And all pleading for politeness aside, um, if right. you're looking, if you're getting information about uh, evolutionary biology from Ray Comfort, you're, you're a freaking idiot, all right? Uh, because Ray Comfort is a well, scientifically yeah. illiterate fool, and he's a liar. I mean, he's a deliberate, bald-faced liar. The point he has had professional biologists, you know, well-known scientists, explain to him in detail exactly how a certain concept in evolutionary biology works, and right. and, and he turns right around and claims no one's ever explained this thing. Yeah, and it's so not he, you know, just so it's all about you know la la la. I can't hear you with him. Yeah, and it's, he is patently dishonest. I it's mean, it's not just that I require him to agree with me; that I require him to accept what scientists mm -hmm. say. But when he hears what actual scientists say about how evolution is supposed to work, and then he says, "Oh, you know, science says that there should be a crocoduck." <laughs> which, yeah, which of course it then does not. he just doesn't understand what people are saying to him, and the fact that he thinks that the lack of a crocoduck proves that evolution doesn't or, work yeah, there are no means that he's fossils. just not freaking paying attention. Yeah, it's, it's, the people who say there are no transitional fossils don't know what transitional fossils are. They right. think in terms of things like crocoduck. That's right. what they're looking for. They're looking for something that's like half fish and half person. But that's not what the theory says. So, remotely. I mean, what I recommend, rather than watching some schmoes on TV, is to pick up a textbook or a mm -hmm. popularized book from a scientist who explains how evolution works. Not because I want to make you believe that evolution works, but I would like you to be arguing against what evolution really says, mm -hmm. which, which has converged to a particular explanation because it's science and, pe mm -hmm. and people tend to move towards agreement rather than 38,000 sects. Sure, <laughs> sure. But it, it, and it also comes down to who are you going to listen to, right? I mean, who are you going to get your information about biology from? Actual biologists? 
or someone who is emphatically not a biologist but a preacher. You know, it's, if something is wrong with your car, are you going to get an opinion from mechanics as to what's wrong with your car? Or are you going to talk to your tinfoil hat neighbor who says, well, I think it's the Illuminati teleporting gremlins <laughs> under the hood of your car to make it all messed up? I, I mean, I'm gonna, sure. I mean, who are you going to take seriously? I'm sure that the love of Jesus could heal my engine right. when, it, when it's not working. But frankly, I find it more reliable to take it to a mechanic mm -hmm. who actually knows what he's doing and will actually take direct actions to fix the car rather than yeah. saying incantations right. to, to an invisible man in the sky. So they're saying, if you think you have a legitimate criticism of a scientific theory, be sure to actually learn what the scientific theory actually is and what it actually says. Yeah. Yeah, and don't just critique straw mans of it. But anyway, let's <laughs> take another call. Okay. Getting, we got I'm not anyways. sure whether to take this one or not. Which one? Number two. Well, no, I'm going to just pick one. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. All right, Keith in Flemington, you're there. We're so professional here. <laughs> Hello? Keith? You're Hi. on the air, if you can hear us or not. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, um, I called in uh, a couple weeks ago, and I spoke to um, I spoke to one of you, I think, about Probably the uh, out of body experiences. And uh, you know, I'm I'm atheist as well, and I, this is the one thing that I have to say that I really struggle with. With a lot of um, there's a lot of scientists that are actually putting together uh, not scientists but doctors putting together projects. Uh, to actually test out these theories because they're saying they're so overwhelming that they really don't feel that this is just an hallucination anymore. And I, I, I put together some uh, sites. I don't know if you guys are able to, you know, check these out. Or I, I was getting together an email to send to Matt um, based on there's uh, projects going on and, and scientists that are actually looking into I don't know if you've ever, ever heard of uh, Dr. Andrew Newmark. He's a neuroscientist. Mm, um, and, and, also Dr. Grayson, bell, and they're um, they're they have a lot of uh, scientific theories and, and they're ta actually taking it seriously on how life changing a lot of this stuff has been for, for thousands of people. And if you just want one website, you know, I don't want to take up so much of your time. There's one website, it's the International Association for Near Death Studies, and it's I A N D S dot org. Um you know, uh, and uh, uh, like like I said, um, I think you know the Bible, the whole nine yards, uh, religion, the whole nine yards. I, th I just think it's all bogus. I really do, mm -hmm. and I'm not for it. But when I when I look into this, and I'm completely coming from a non-biased standpoint, when I look into this stuff, it just seems so that like there's something there that's just that you know. Right. Well, I, that I, is I that think is. I would be, uh, that's. It would be stupid not to look into it. it just can seems, I can yeah. I recommend a site for you in return? I'm sorry? Can I recommend a site for you in return? Absolutely. Skeptics Dictionary, S-K-E-P, excuse me, S-K-E-P-D-I-C dot com, uh, and Google, and search it for near-death experiences and and see what you come up with. Right. But yeah, but th that apart, um, yeah, well, we don't deny that people have experiences that are strange and inexplicable and that are life-changing. Uh, just because an experience is life-changing doesn't mean that it is an experience necessarily rooted in reality. It could just be something that went on. I mean, if that were the case, right, then you would have to say, well, religion changes people's lives, therefore the religion must be true. So there has to be a greater body of, of actual tangible evidence that can be studied. Now, we do know that um, the experience of an out, you know, the out-of-body experience, experience has been replicated uh, through electrical stimulation of a part of the brain called the angular gyrus, which would, you know, seem to indicate that, yeah, there's a lot of it that's neurochemical, right? And it's just like, you know, when people, you know, would trip out on LSD and they say, oh, I've had this amazing spiritual experience <coughs> with a... No, you had a chemical experience, right? I mean, brain chemistry, you can mess with it and it can do some amazing stuff and alter your perception of reality. So you need to... Yeah. We need to what we need to get to the bottom of is, is what's happening in an out-of-body experience happening in reality? Or is it simply the individual's perception of reality being skewed by, um, you know, something going on with their brain chemistry? Now, either way, it can be a life-changing event. But a life-changing event doesn't necessarily prove that it's not just all in the mind. Um, right, right. So, uh, now, I, on the one hand, I, I think that, right, a legitimate scientific study ought to be done in, you know, what might be thought of as... 
I don't know if you'd call this a paranormal claim or just, or, or just extraordinary claims. Sure, why not, right? There could be legitimate scientific study done into, into the possible existence of this or ghosts or auras or whatever, you know, the yeah, du jour thing sure. is, is going on right now. Um, my worry, though, is that you can get people, and even people with legitimate scientific credentials, um, just because you've got a PhD in a scientific field is not an automatic sort of deflector shield against irrationality, right? Uh -huh. And there are people who can go into these things with some biases. And what, they, what their studies end up as turns out to be some big exercise in confirmation bias. And so it's, it's tricky to guard against that. And fortunately, the scientific method has peer review, which is the built-in way of guarding against that, right? I mean, that's how we caught cold fusion, and that's how we caught, you know, the, the, how, how that whole, those results were all bogus, right? Yeah, so it's, um, not really, it's not really about um, a, a chemical uh, change that they're really uh, trying to look into. It's, it really, you know, there's a lot more to it than just that. Last time I called in, there was a guy that called in afterwards, uh, and he's like, oh, yeah, I had out-of-body experiences. I set up a playing card, and I couldn't find the playing card or whatever. But but these are uh, you know these are actually um, studies that are being done that are that that actually tell the tale of somebody actually looking into another room of what's going on while they're supposedly dead or or um, you know asleep or the, the the blood's been drained out of their brain uh, for this certain procedure to take out. Well, I think they would uh, kill you actually if you and, that. But and <laughs> yeah, they can well. they're actually you know telling what's going on or, or actually reporting. As to what happened in another, in another room, or you know, yeah. again, you need to, again, you need to a hallucination, um, and that's why they set up. They, they set up. A, it's called the Aware Project. Right, but I mean, the point, the point of the con the point of the card thing was that this is a specific thing that you can test, rather than uh, I, I mean, you know, whether one thing's on a card or another thing's on a card. Uh, right. This is a this is a specific thing where you can objectively say yes, absolutely, it was the two of spades. Whereas if the person you know you're in a non-controlled situation where the person happens to luckily uh, describe something that that resembles what's in a room mm -hmm. um, you know th that's not so easy to be objective about uh, so I mean there are a lot of ways that these that these supposed studies can actually go wrong and and then you know um, the other right. good thing about the card is that there's a very, very, very low probability that you could actually consistently read uh, or guess what a card is, where there is, where, whereas there is a high probability that you could guess that, that um, you know, a particular person is in a room who's frequently there anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, even dreams, I mean, you know, actual dreams can generally... Um, you know, they often seem to be prophetic because we dream about stuff that we have experience with. And we ignore all the times that we have dreams that don't relate to anything that really happened. When we have a dream based on our own experiences about something that turns out later to have happened, then we mm -hmm. tend to uh, pay special attention to the hits and ignore the misses. Mm -hmm. And then when you've okay, had, say, an can, I just say, can I just say one thing? Okay. Uh, and then we're going to move on. If, if you guys will look it up at some point, it's called the Aware Project, and that's being put out. And what they're doing is they're putting uh, images, uh, they're called targets, and they're putting them face up on the ceiling of six different hospitals. Okay. And, the, the, you know, the doctors are very skeptical, and they're thinking that it's going to come out as a wash, that nobody's going to be able to do it or, or whatever. And I'm kind of in the same boat. I just find it very um, interesting that they're, they even bother Scientists I'm, and doctors th that they're even devoting time to this. Well, well I mean, why shouldn't they bother? I'm if glad that they're bothering. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if there's if there's legitimate, I mean, sure. I mean, these things. If people are making these claims, <laughs> then why not test them, right? And if they if they care to test them, then that's great. But um, you know, it, as Russia, we were talking earlier about like this particular experiment that was done. Well, the one experiment isn't enough. Then if you get a certain if you get certain results that look good. Now the trick becomes, can you, you replicate a, them? You need a big sample yeah. set, and you need statistically very significant results. You need a big body of evidence to justify this. And not just anecdotes, either. You can't say, well, there was a dude in the room, and he right. had a I thing. I heard some stuff. guy, yeah. or yeah. you know, there, there can even be selection bias among studies, where, at, where um, you know, there may be a, a thousand studies done um, trying to uh, show some evidence of near-death experience, and one of them luckily happens to have a very high success rate, 
mm -hmm. out of a thousand. So people cherry pick this ex this one experiment. Yeah. So, uh, I well, mean, those are all the kind of things know. you got to guard against, anyway. Right. Let's move anyway, on. Anyway, yeah. Thanks for calling. Yeah, appreciate um, it very much. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. Uh, to remind people who are watching this show and not the Super Bowl, uh, you know, we're a lot of cool people who you can come and hang out with after the show. Um, you know, even people from Mark's church, as long as they're coming just to hang out and be friendly and, and not proselytize sure, at us because yeah, we enjoy yeah. our Mexican food. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely. And that is at El Arroyo, which uh, I hope they will put the address up on the screen yeah, in just a minute because I lost my announcements on here. That's all right. Um, but probably, yeah, come on down. It's on Sixth Street, I believe, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and and have some dinner with us. And seriously, Mark, we're sorry. Yeah, call back next week. Uh, people who are watching from Mark's Church today, thank you. Um, you know, we're just trying to get a point of view out there. Uh, we're not trying to steal your babies. <laughs> uh, um, and we hope you keep watching. Yeah, yeah. They, that, we didn't want that to happen. We didn't mean to. Lose right. your audio there, so we. I I would have given Mark like most of the show, sure, if he had stuck around. Yeah. Um. Okay, so, right, so we got Matt we in got South left. Carolina. It's about ten minutes left, probably seven. Well, Matt, Hello, can you Matt? hear us? Maybe it is line four. No, that's line three. Matt on line. Matt. Th can right. you hear us, Matt, on line three? I'm oh. sorry. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear us? You're on. Uh, hi. Uh, it's really total to hear you. Hold on. Uh, okay. I, uh, I wanted to ask a question about uh, morality. Uh, basically, if uh, God has a different morality than us, say a better one or uh, a one with a different sense of good, uh, then how is it that we can judge him on his actions? Uh, and that's basically it. Well, if we can't judge him, then how do you know it's better? Well, that, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the point. I, I'm, I, I'm, personally, I'm an atheist. I, I'm, I'm okay. just trying to uh, answer this, this question uh, in, in a conversation with someone else. Is this a theist and, uh, who has I, uh, said this to you, that we can't, really, well, God's morality is different than ours, so we can't judge it? Is that his argument? Um, it, it's, I mean, if, if we have, uh, yeah, well, essentially it's, we can't judge God on his actions because we ha only have our own, you know, we only have our own reasoning and such. And, uh... But if this God is the, the source Bible. of God. our morals, if he believes that this God is a source of our morals, then it's like, well, why did God create a whole separate set of morals for us to abide by that are different from his? Why would he have done that? I, I mean, where's the, where, yeah. I mean, it's completely irrational. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, he, he actually supports the idea that we can come to our own mora uh, morals. In like, which case, not, why do we need not God? Not derive them from the Bible. All right. All right. I, I mean, I've got a problem with this separate morality thing in that, um, you know, people really need to do what makes sense to their moral system. Because, uh, I mean, hypothetically, let's say that it turns out that God, the God of the universe, does not actually hold a special place for humans. He actually... Um, his chosen creatures are, are space aliens from, you know, a thousand <laughs> light years away. But the reason that in his divine plan he created the earth and all humans is because we are, in about a thousand years from now, we are destined to make a tasty snack on the way across uh, through this galaxy. <laughs> if that were part of God's divine purpose, I don't think we have an obligation to you know, stick to his plan. <laughs> I mm -hmm. think actually that as our own autonomous uh, individuals, we would be morally obligated to still fight the aliens and the God <laughs> um, mm -hmm. because, uh, because, I mean, why is that morality right and the, the morality that we have collectively come to as a society and basically agreed on I mean, the stuff that is is pretty much no-brainers for anyone living in a civ civilized country, like don't kill and don't steal, which predated the Bible by quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, why, are, why is that not a, a reasonable uh, moral system to come to instead of this supernatural being? Yeah, no, uh, that's a good answer. 
<laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, yeah. Hope you use it well. Took care of that one. <laughs> okay. Thanks for calling. We appreciate it, Matt. Bye. We really do. Thanks a lot. And um, uh, we got Mike in Chicago. Yeah, we have. And uh, we got like five three, minutes, four five or five minutes, minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Mike. Hello. Hi, Hi, Mike. You're on. Hey, how are you doing? We're good. Um, you sound clear. That's nice. All right. So this is the situation I find myself in. Um, you know, all through high school and part of college, uh, you know, I had a lot of rationally thinking friends not a while ago. But now I've transferred into a Christian college, and one of the requirements is a Bible study class. Mm. And so I, I want to remain firm and not just get walked over, but I was, I was wondering how, I mean, you guys must have experience with being, you know, overwhelmed by the amount of opposing arguments there are. Uh, what do you guys have? Not especially. Uh, like, tip, trick to, you know, get through, and, you know. Well, um, why are you in a Christian college? Yeah, uh, that's... I'm in a Christian college because their nursing program is one of the best around. Okay. And so um, it's one of those things where, you know, what do I, what do I value more? Um, the I mean, excellent nursing program or the other stuff? Yeah, so, I mean, that is the question. It's, it's really up to you to answer. I mean, uh, it, I'm sure that it is it's a not shame the that, only yeah. school with a good nursing program. Yeah, I mean, but it's a I shame that they sort of hold their nursing program hostage uh, to people, <laughs> you know, is, uh, on the condition that you have to take their, their uh, Bible study classes. But, um, you know, that, that unfortunately is how they work. It's like, oh, you want the benefits? Well, you have to do this bit. Right. So, um, but all that aside, I, I think that you can really only, uh, like, is there a specific argument that you have gotten in the class at the, uh, up to this point that you, has been sort of a stumper well, for you? I don't know if we have time we may for not have, yeah. specific arguments, but what I would say in general is yeah. maybe what Sun Tzu would say <laughs> is do not attack the enemy where he is strong. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't particularly see that you're obligated to take on an entire room full of people who are just going to bark at you. Um, yeah. You know, I think that uh, the best you can hope for is to maybe educate yourself and maybe some fellow students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but, you know, listen to what people are saying and then, and then read up on them afterwards from the comfort of your own home when you're not being pressured. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, have some personal chats with individuals that, that you think are... Uh, you know, potential allies. Yeah. Uh, and, but there, and there are a lot of uh, really good online resources uh, that uh, that are devoted to critiquing common apologetics. There's infidels.org, which has the whole... Iron Chariots. Iron Chariots, I was going to mention. Um, Iron Chariots Wiki, which is, again, uh, the counter-apologetics wiki. Mm -hmm. And these are all offering right. very detailed, uh, you know, uh, rebuttals to the most common apologetic points that are made. Right. But and it could be a very useful my, class in that you will, you will hear what their arguments are firsthand, right from the horse's mouth. Right. And, and you and know, the, the cliche about the one lone student who bravely stands up in the room full of his, you know, full of the, the evil professor and the, mm -hmm. you know, in the room full of hostile people and completely shames him, that's mostly just Jack Chick's fantasy life. Right. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't assume that you can do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like I, I wouldn't have had a problem with it if it weren't for the, some of the things that the teacher's saying and you just look around the classroom and everyone's just like nodding like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry, but we I'm, are I'm absolutely so we are out of time. We're, we're oh. really out of time. So um, hang on. I'll put you on hold and maybe you can come back. But anyway, Doing that's our show. show. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, for um Sorry again about the phone, but it happens here. And, uh, you know... People from church, feel free to keep watching and calling, and bye. Bye. <laughs>